it seems to me that Putin lives in some isolated room in the Kremlin. Nobody really tells him the truth. And he makes up, or you know, his close advisors make up stuff that they think, you know, is going to terrify the West into into leaving Ukraine to its fate. But um, they're absolutely misunderstanding what you know what democracy um, is all about. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we're joined by a former British Army officer, a former commander of NATO's Rapid Reaction Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear Battalion. Hamish de Breton Gordon has more than 20 years experience in CBRN. He is also a biosecurity fellow at Magdalen College, Cambridge, and author of Chemical Warrior. Hamish de Breton Gordon, welcome to Frontline. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, Earlier, I was talking to a former general and military analyst who said that this week it appears to be the counteroffensive has, has reached a kind of pause moment where the Ukrainian side are wondering and assessing their next move. Is that how you see it? Well, I'm not entirely sure that I see it like this. This counteroffensive is a very complex operation, uh, all arms maneuver warfare across a massive front, hundreds of kilometers. And I think what we've seen in the first few weeks of the counteroffensive is a lot of probing attacks up to 27, which is a huge amount, uh, with Ukraine trying to find the weak points uh, in the Russian defense. And once they do that, to then reinforce it. I think uh, for those uninitiated with this sort of activity, and perhaps those who took part in the first and the second Gulf Wars, as I did, uh, when things were over very rapidly and very successfully um, in days, not weeks. I think a lot of people were expecting that. But we're in a very different situation here. You know, the Iraq wars were against a very weak, uh, defeated enemy. Uh, but the Russian force, although it's performing very badly, still has mass of armor and humans. They seem to have uh, no concern about their casualties or collateral damage and almost are fighting in a First World War type attritional fashion and are prepared to take any losses at all. So it's very different. Um, and I think, uh, I think what I've seen of the Ukrainians, they're very canny, they're brilliant soldiers, highly motivated. I think this is just part of the build-up. And when they find that weak point, I'm sure they'll pull through it. So I'm not sure they're poisoning. Um, uh, I think they're just conducting the operations in a really professional uh, way. So uh, one would expect this to continue and at some stage would expect them to find that breach and pull through it. And at the time of us speaking now, Hamish, uh, one of the latest developments is a strike on the Konar Bridge, which links Kherson province to the Crimean Peninsula. How serious is that? Well, I think um, this is all part of what we call shaping operations trying to shape the battlefield for, the, for your own benefit, for the Ukrainian benefit. And we've seen a number of deep strikes deep behind Russian lines to cut off their logistics uh, so that they can't get ammunition, supplies, and more troops to the front. And uh, this bridge does seem to be a key bridge, um, not necessarily just for getting logistics forward, but also to get any Russian troops out if they want to reposition them. And the Russians seem to be doing... You know, they have what we call a strategic reserve. They have a reserve of mobile forces behind the lines that they will move to where they think that the Ukrainians can try and break through. And I think what Ukraine is doing by attacking the bridge and attacking other areas in depth is to give lots of things for the Russian command to think about. And what we've seen about the Russian command, it's not very agile. Only the very senior people can make decisions about moving forces around. I expect even Putin has his finger in it. Um, so by creating this, um, these challenges for the Russian military, like blowing the bridge, um, I think it's, it, it will be designed to confuse the Russians, move their troops around. Um, so I think it's all part of these shaping operations and expect to see a lot more of them because now that the Ukrainians have got this, the British Storm Shadow missile, which is very accurate over a long, long range and very powerful. They can do lots of type of operations like this. And 
the Russians seem unable to prevent it happening. So I think it's all part of shaping the battlefield so it gives Ukraine military the best advantage that it can get. For some time now, you've been warning about the potential dangers of a strike on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And President Zelensky has now said that his intelligence reveals that Russia was plotting a terrorist attack on it. Um, Cynically, you could argue that making those kind of statements will make the Western allies sit up and it will increase their resolve to support Ukraine. Do you see this as a serious a piece of intelligence or actually some kind of part of the rhetoric? Well, I think that I think there are a number of things here. You know, certainly the, the, the deception um, uh, is is coming from both sides. And of course, both sides are using, you know, the Internet intelligence and information to their best advantage. Um, however, from the get go, Putin has been threatening nuclear strikes. He's been using the nuclear card. Um, And at the very beginning, it was to keep NATO out of the fight. Now, what it's done, of course, is the exact opposite. Uh, Finland, the most powerful army in Europe, is now part of NATO. It looks like Sweden will shortly join. And um, it is highly likely that Ukraine, after the conflict, will also become a member of NATO. So the the nuclear peace has failed. However, you know, it it is something that I, I... have worked with all my sort of military and civilian life. And the psychological uh, element to threatening uh, nuclear or chemical attack is tenors to one, the physical. Uh, That's a quote from Napoleon, um, really, not not on the chemical side, but the fact that psychologically you can have a huge impact by doing these sort of things. Now, when it comes to Zaporizhia itself, I think Zaporizhia is... You know, the threat of Zaporizhia, an accident um, at Zaporizhia, is the most worrying element to this conflict from a nuclear perspective at the moment. I don't believe that Putin can use his his nuclear weapons, his strategic ones, sort of smaller ones, which, again, uh, President Biden suggested this week he was concerned the Ru- Russians might use them. I, I think they're pretty unusable because of the range. They only have a short range. Um, and I am sure that uh, NATO would would stop them being fired because although they're deemed small, they're still massive. They're still the size of the Hiroshima bomb is is the smallest tactical nuclear weapon that the Russians have. But so when we look at Zaporizhia, um, if you look at it from a cold hearted strategic um, perspective, as a military person, I could see the military advantage of creating an accident there with the ensuing radiation contamination because it would likely to go laterally east or west and that would be in front of the attacking Ukrainian forces. Um, I had the great honour to be the Peshmerga's chemical weapons advisor. The Peshmerga are the Iraqi Kurds who fought on our behalf against ISIS in, in northern Iraq. And I was their advisor in between 2015 and 2017. And at one point in 2017, ISIS, the Islamic State group, terror group, blew up a factory called Al Mishrak, um, which was a massive chemical factory south of Mosul, and put 400,000 tons of sulfur dioxide into the air, which cut off the Iraqi army advance, who the Peshmerga were supported, and delayed their advance by about three weeks or so. So that there is, you know, that there, there, there is history in people using um, environment and using industrial facilities like nuclear power stations to create a, a barrier. So from a purely military perspective, one could see the advantage that Russians would get from blowing up a nuclear power station. We also know that the International Atomic Energy Agency have uh, visited and Senor Grossi, the head, was only there a few weeks ago and they are concerned with the state of Zaporizhia. And many people have reported, and, and in fact, President Zelensky earlier this week said that they had intelligence that uh, the Russians had put mines in, in the nuclear power station. The fact that there are 500 Russian troops there, one, that seems to me quite likely. Now, when you create the biggest environmental disaster 
since um, Chernobyl by blowing up the dam to the west of Zaporizhia. To me, it is a fairly small step or a small escalation to them go and blow up a nuclear power station. So I think it is, whether it's accidental or deliberate, um, having the second largest nuclear power station in the world in a war zone being fought over is absolutely something to be avoided. So I'm hugely concerned. However, I would say there are there are two things that happened very recently uh, that give me some hope. Um, first of all, yesterday in Washington, there was a, a move by senators to have a motion to say that if the Russians blew up Zaporizhia, that would be an Article 5 event against NATO. In other words, that would bring NATO into the conflict, uh, which is absolutely what Putin is trying to avoid. So I think actually a threat like that is 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 the most positive thing that has happened. The other element uh, that I and a number of other people have been calling for is for a demilitarized zone around Zaporizhia. And um, in, in a piece that I've written for, for, for The Telegraph, I've called on the Chinese to get involved. If the Chinese set up a demil demilitarized zone around Zaporizhia, I don't think the Russians uh, would attack them. So I'm concerned, but with activities in Washington yesterday and potential activities in the future, you know, I'm slightly more reassured that maybe the danger of that happening is is lessening. You talked about the dam. You talked about the nuclear power plant. What other areas cause concern to you? Well, from, from my particular background in, in chemical, biological and nuclear, I'm also aware, and, and relating to my uh, piece with the Peshmerga in northern Iraq a few years ago, that there is a very large chemical factory called the Titan Chemical Factory in northwest Crimea, which, again, there is information and intelligence that the Russians might be planning to blow that up, similar to ISIS. That factory would put many thousands of tonnes also of sulfur dioxide into the air, which is very toxic and very poisonous and would affect um, any advance by Ukrainian forces. Uh, I... There is also reporting that the Kursk nuclear power station, which is in Russia, but on the Ukrainian border to the east, uh, reports similar to what we've heard about Zaporizhia. So I am concerned. These areas are under the Geneva Conventions are supposed to be protected, um, like schools and hospitals are. And each side who signed the Geneva Convention, which happens to be Russia and Ukraine and others, are supposed to honour it and not attack these sites. But as I saw it firsthand in Syria between um, 2013 and uh, 2022, actually, that's exactly what the Russians did. They attacked schools, they attacked hospitals, they attacked infrastructure because militarily they were failing. And the architect of that type of warfare, what I call unconventional violence, General Sabayakin, is also now the commander of Russian forces in Ukraine. So it's no surprise that they're following similar tactics. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna change that. What uh, we must do is to enable Ukraine to prevail as quickly as possible um, so that we can get peace there and get the place reconstructed. And the reconstruction meeting conference that's happening in London over the last couple of days gives one hope that the West, the international community will provide the wherewithal to help the country rebuild. As you mentioned earlier, it, it does seem that there seems to be a battle for control of the narrative uh, and influencing allies uh, with the narrative on both sides. And um, the latest from the FSB, the security service, uh, the Russian security service, is that five people have been arrested trying to buy a kilo of radioactive cesium-137 for, a, and they're saying it's for a Ukrainian citizen to potentially carry out some kind of uh, incident uh, to discredit Russia. Um, is that just part of the toing and froing of disinformation? Oh, I think it is. I mean, it, it's uh, the, I, I think when people study this conflict and look at the disinformation, uh, look at the, the narratives coming out of particularly Russia, um, which are getting more ridiculous almost by the day, you only have to look at the, um, you know, the Russian embassy in the UK, 
the, the complete drivel that comes out of there every day. Um, you know, I, I cannot believe that people typing it, you know, can do it with a straight face. And, and when, when you look at this latest thing um, of the SSB allegedly uh, arresting somebody who was buying $3 million worth of cesium-137 for a dirty bomb um, in, in Ukraine. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous. Now, had they said it was, um, or, or were they doing it to prove that actually it was going to be the Ukrainians who were going to create a nuclear event, then then fair enough, because cesium-137 is one of the isotopes you get if you blow up a nuclear power station or if you create, if you if there is a nuclear event a, 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 a nuclear weapon goes off so but having it as a dirty bomb is is ridiculous i mean it, the, the whole dirty bomb thing is an anathema anyway i've never really heard of of a successful dirty bomb the idea that you get this cesium and then blow it up and spread it around is is ridiculous it wouldn't get anywhere but but if if you planted it and said that there had been a nuclear attack, then there is some credence because it was it is what you get after a nuclear bomb goes off. But again, I think it is part of the the R Russian narrative, and you know, as I'm quite often on the end of it, um, with you know, you you write a piece in the Telegraph or do this uh, uh, pod for the the Times. No doubt, when it's published, uh, the Russian embassy and the Russian government will will come up with some drivel that um, that I'm. You know what, what I'm saying is is as ridiculous as what they're saying. It's it is part of. I'm afraid you know with with social media and everything you know so much information around distorting it is is relatively easy. And when you just get snippets of it, um, you know I even see what I consider to be you know highly intelligent and educated people sometimes repeating this Russian rubbish. And, and, you know, if they are doing it, that is a real concern. But, but I think it's one of those things, you know, if you, if you say something often enough, if you throw enough mud at the wall, some of it will stick. And that it is just a torrent of propaganda and rubbish. And I think it's up to people like, like me and, and, and proper media like The Times to make sure that people get the proper story, not not the diluted drivel coming out of Moscow. It's interesting because um, when you say, if you say it enough, some mud sticks, and President Putin has, has, has announced um, the positioning of tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, what, four times maybe already? And now he's uh, announcing that these uh, the Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missiles will be ready to be deployed and used soon. Um, I mean, is that all part of this foolish kind of... It, we, we had someone on Times Radio recently, William Courtney, who was a former advisor to Bill Clinton, saying this is all just like foolish rhetoric to compensate for Russian battlefield losses. Well, I think it is. Um... People will remember at the beginning of the conflict, Putin was hyping his hypersonic missiles. These were missiles that would defeat anything NATO had. Uh, they moved so quickly that uh, that is what gave, would give the Russians advantage over NATO. However, we've already seen that every, virtually every hypersonic missile Russia has fired at Ukraine has been shot down. Um, you know, they are... They are no more effective than your average cruise missile. And I think because the Russian military have failed so badly, um, uh, a report I helped do recently was detailing the fact that, you know, although the Ukrainians are claiming that they have destroyed over 4,000 Russian tanks, actually, they're probably right. They have destroyed over 4,000 Russian tanks. And that is... Incredible. When you think the British military has 100 tanks, um, you know, the losses on that scale. And also when you think of the human losses, um, again, figures are difficult to quantify. But I think, you know, a lot of um, really reliable sources have put the Russian losses at around 200,000 soldiers dead, which is, again, these are First World War casualty rates. And you know, how, how does Putin look the parents in the eyes of those 200,000 predominantly 
males, predominantly young, predominantly untrained with very poor equipment, who have been thrown over the top in some sort of First World War type charge. So, yeah, one can see that actually, you know, conventionally militarily, the Russians are going to take years, if not decades, to rebuild what they've, they've lost. I mean, the only thing they really have left is their Air Force now, uh, which is beginning to show uh, on the battlefield. So all these claims of having these wonder weapons, again, it's, it's, it seems to me that Putin lives in some isolated room in the Kremlin. Nobody really tells him the truth. And he makes up, or you know, his close advisors make up stuff that they think, you know, is going to terrify the West into into leaving Ukraine to its fate. But um, they're absolutely misunderstanding what you know what democracy um, is all about, and that you know, the West must ensure that Ukraine prevails. And if Putin or any of his his um, his advisors, you know, are threatening and trying to use nuclear weapons or biological chemical weapons against the West, it is absolutely going to bring NATO in. And if NATO comes in, you know, Russia will be, you know, will be finished for some time. So I think it just shows desperation. But, you know, we all want this war, war over as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, the longer it lasts, the more people on both sides are going to die, which is why it's so important we give Ukraine everything it needs to get this finished as quickly as possible. And you have produced a new safety survival course for Ukrainians in the event of a nuclear incident. What kind of scenario are you envisaging and what could you do? How much could it actually help? Well, um, this is really from what um, what we learned in Syria. Uh, in Syria, I was basically trying to protect civilians against chemical attacks. So there were over 200 chemical attacks in Syria, generally with toxic industrial chemicals like chlorine, and the people who suffered were, were civilians. And sadly, the, most people who suffered were children because although chlorine is not very toxic, it's, you know, one breath would kill a child, whereas a grown adult can probably take three or four breaths and still survive. But what we learned in Syria is by trying to educate people on what to do in the event of attack, actually that, um, although we couldn't give them gas masks and all the rest of it, by having the basics, because a lot of what you do in a nuclear or chemical attack is counterintuitive. You know, you, the last place you want to be if there is a chemical attack is underground because the chemicals are heavier than air and go underground. And that's what happened in Syria. So um, we we learned a lot from that. And then when the Ukraine conflict came along, I was approached by the Thompson Foundation. You do a lot of training for journalists in, in war zones. And we decided that we would um, try and produce uh, some training courses on Telegram. Very, very simple. That people could follow and you mentioned my, my book chemical warrior that at the back of the book the appendix is how you survive a chemical or nuclear attack so um i thought well let's publish that free on the internet for people in ukraine and then thompson said well let's try and do better than that and have an app that anybody can use so on, on the nuclear side that's exactly what we've done and i've Try to tweet it around recently as people are really worried about Zaporizhia, which really tells people what to do before an event to prepare. Because in the event of a, some sort of nuclear accident, you basically want to have enough food and water to survive until the radiation and contamination is gone. And it will go. And um, you also need to know what to do soon after the event. And that's basically get inside because you know if you are if you survive the initial blast if you know what to do you've got a really good chance of surviving you know the whole thing but it does mean staying inside avoiding the contamination and and then coming out once the contamination's gone because it will move you know on the wind and, and when it's on the ground um you know you can you can i, I don't want to trivialize it but but you can walk on it and the key thing about radiation is knowing exactly where it is and exactly what it is and its density, because you know the human humans, you, you, we can take radiation. It's just that if you have too much of it, you know it can kill you. But there are ways of avoiding that. So, so the the app on Telegram is all about 
preparation, what to do in the event and what to do afterwards, and also telling people to listen to the emergency services because they will, again, advise people what to do. And you were the military advisor on a new documentary which has been examining the evidence of war crimes in Ukraine, and it appears to have found evidence of the use of white phosphorus. Um, what is that exactly, and what can it do? Well, the, uh, the documentary Eastern Front uh, by John Sweeney, uh, who's based out in, in Kiev, was looking at a whole host of war crimes, in particular um, white phosphorus. White phosphorus is is a military uh, weapon, if you like, uh, used for illumination at night or to create a smoke stream during the day. And in the, when it's used for that, it's entirely within the convention, war, war rules and uh, Geneva Conventions. However, it is also an incendiary device. It burns at a very, very high temperature. And uh, what I saw in Syria in particular were the Russians and the Syrian regime were actually using white phosphorus to burn towns and villages down in a sort of medieval scorched earth policy. You know, basically, if people are not going to leave, burn their homes and burn them and they will go. Uh, and we saw that. And we've also seen it in Ukraine. I'm sure people remember the, the battle for Mariupol at the beginning of last year, horrendous battle. Um, eventually, uh, the Russians dropped a lot of white phosphorus on on Mariupol and basically burnt everybody, burnt everybody out. And that's what John Sweeney's documentary is looking at, documentary evidence of towns and villages in eastern Ukraine that were hit with white phosphorus, burned villages down, burned people. And it, when it's used in that fashion, burning civilians is a war crime and against every rule of war and every convention. And have you uh, become aware of the use of chemical weapons anywhere else in the war in Ukraine? Um, there have been rumours. I have seen no evidence yet of the direct use. Um, there were some chemical factories uh, to the east northeast of Kiev that were hit at the beginning of the conflict. You know, the, what one of the troubles with with this sort of attack? They're completely deniable, um, and of course the Russians you know, would deny it. But the use of chemical warfare agents like uh, the Russian Novichok, we, we have seen none of it. Um, and are we likely to say it? I'm, I'm not sure. The only, the only thing that concerns me is somebody who's prepared to blow up a dam that then leaves 2 million people without fresh water, that destroys millions of acres of prime agricultural land and puts thousands of people out of their homes. Um, if you're prepared to do that, I think you're prepared to do almost anything to win. And certainly at the moment, the Russians are not winning. As a former tank commander, you'll be watching closely how Ukraine puts its, count, its tanks to use in the counteroffensive. And you've said that Ukrainian forces are superior to the Russian counterparts at combined arms warfare. How will they put that to good effect? Well, we're, we're yet to see their combined arms warfare in full flow. However, we do know that uh, they've been in the UK training on our own Challenger 2 tanks, which they now have. And, you know, I'm living very close to where that training was happening. Um, so we, we know that they were well trained. We also know that they have spent you know, probably up to two months doing combined arms training. That is tanks, training with artillery, training with infantry and training with air power. Um, and this is going to be crucial because the Russian forces are very static. We have seen no um, ability of the Russians to manoeuvre, to manoeuvre out, which is why the, the offensive at the moment, looking for the way to break through. And I think when they do, the Ukrainian tanks and you know, all, all that I've seen and heard of Ukrainian tank crews and Ukrainian soldiers impresses me. And you know they really have the moral component here, which the Russians don't. So once they break through, the Russian front line and get behind the Russians. I think that's when we will see this war hopefully come to a conclusion because they can move very rapidly over very large areas. And once they get behind the Russians, the Russians will in effect be defeated.
But the challenge is considerable, isn't it? Because even pitting that expertise in combined arms warfare against Russia's superiority in the air, its sheer number of troops, and the fact that, that it is Russia is not on the offensive, it's the Ukrainians, which is more difficult to achieve. It, it is a huge challenge, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a massive challenge. And, and you make a very good point about the air. I mean, that's why the Ukrainians have been shouting for F-16s since the beginning of the conflict. And you know, hopefully they're, they're now going to get it. I mean, I, you know, we should have given it to them in the first place. We should have given them tanks in the first place. But people are now realising, you know, this is an existential threat to the peace in Europe and we must prevail. It's absolutely going to be challenging and difficult. Um, however, uh, the Ukrainians will be getting fantastic intelligence from the UK and the US and others. Um, and... I, I will overemphasize the moral component. Um, you know, it's. I feel sorry in a way for Russian soldiers. Now, having been a soldier myself for 23 years and spent the last 10 years on the battlefields of the world, you know, I know how, how challenging it is. You really need to want to fight. You really need to have it in your heart to do it. And, it, and if you're not, then you'll be ineffective. And, you know, it, the Russians have squads behind these young soldiers that if they turn around they shoot them um and you, you know that is not going to be effective so it is going to be a huge challenge and there are going to be lots of casualties on both sides which is why it is absolutely beholden on the us ourselves and the whole of nato to give ukraine absolutely everything it needs because you know if we don't we're going to have to get involved in the conflict on the ground ourselves and that would be a complete disaster for all. Um, Hamish, just finally, everyone is asking how this war will end. What do you think the consequences, though, will be for global security? Well, I think there are. I think nobody in their heart of hearts can say exactly how it's going to end and what the end state is going to be. Um, let's hope that Ukraine does get this breakthrough removes Russia from Crimea and the Donbass, then we get round the negotiation table, uh, we have a peace. But it is it is absolutely fundamental. I think, you know, one of my one I, I have written in my piece today is that, you know, had had NATO and the West um absolutely enforced the red lines that it produced since the end of the Cold War, particularly the chemical red line, Obama's red line, uh, in Syria in 2012, 2013, we would not be in this place. Um, Putin attacked Ukraine because he wanted Ukraine. He wanted it, you know, as part of the part of Russia, Russian Federation. And he thought because of our activities since the Cold War, that the, the international community in NATO would do nothing and let him do it. Now, that has got to be the biggest lesson. There are tyrants about like Putin. I mean, he, go back a bit, and, and Hitler was the previous one, uh, again, who, who attacked Europe because he, he thought he could do. And although we would like to see a world where there are no tyrants, um, that, that is just not the human race, sadly. Um, and there is the rest of the axis of evil, you know, Iran and North Korea. Um, and it, it is behest on us. I think we've all been so focused in the fight against terrorists and the counter-terror threat, Islamic State, et cetera, et cetera that we've forgotten that there are tyrants like Putin about. So, yeah, it's um, it's got to be a redrawing of the lines. Um, everybody wants peace and nobody wants nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, people who think um, that we can ju just get away without all of this, live in a fantasy world and not the real world. And unfortunately, um, tyrants like Putin only react to strength which, you know, going back to one of our earlier points, I'm delighted the US Senate is saying that, you know, if you blow up Zaporizhia and nuclear power station, we'll get involved because to me, that's the only way that's going to stop him doing it. So we do need to reassess things. War is terrible to be avoided at all costs, but unfortunately the human race is not going to change into a peace-loving, harmonious globe in the next couple of years. And people have just got to realise that and do our best to prevent this sort of thing happening in future. Hey, Mr. Brett and Gordon, thank you so much for your time today. You've been watching Frontline with me, Kate Chabot. My thanks to today's producer, Morgan Burdick, and to you for watching. Bye-bye.